Hello and thank you for joining us on the Our Aberdeen Connecting to Our Collections virtual journey up the coast. So all on board for the SS Our Aberdeen. We've packed our cosy blanket. We've got our fine piece for the fly cup halfway through maybe. We've donned our woolly hats and we've tightened our life jacket. Safety first. And we're ready to set sail up the east coast from Catterline to Rattray Head, looking at artworks and objects from our collections along the way. So we've boarded our boat at the little coastal village of Catterline, just south of Stonehaven. And I will hand over to Ruth, who will tell you a little bit more about an artist who spent some time there. 2021 marks the centenary year since the birth of artist Joan Erdley in 1921. Joan Erdley was one of the most original and admired British artists of her generation. A painter with a strong connection to Scotland, whose work includes raw yet tender depictions of children in 1950s Glasgow and contrasting loose expressive landscapes painted along the Aberdeenshire coast. Sadly, her career was cut short when she died in 1963, at the age of just 42. Her work, however, lives on and almost 60 years later is being constantly rediscovered by new generations. Joan Erdley trained at Glasgow School of Art and was based in Glasgow during the 50s, where she famously painted the city children who frequented her studio. During this time, she made visits to the cliff top fishing village of Catterline, south of Stonehaven on the Aberdeenshire coast. Moving permanently to Catterline in 1961, her focus changed to working out of doors, capturing the raw elements of sea and coastline. Paintings such as this one, High Tide, A Winter Afternoon, shows a deep connection to the area. She must truly have been out in all weathers to capture the stormy sea in such an expressive way. We have many pieces of Joan Erdley's work in our collection, including drawings, sketches and paintings made at Catterline, including this next work called Winter Sea 4. We'll leave this painting here for a moment so we can all appreciate Erdley's brushwork and how she captured the atmosphere of Catterline. I'll hand over to Karen now for our next port of call. So we're gliding along nicely, the wind in our faces and the smell of the sea spray in the air. As we approach a rocky outcrop, we slow down to gaze up at the magnificent ruins of Don Otter Castle. Don Otter Castle sits in a dramatic location on the Concardenshire coastline, just south of Stonehaven, and it's an important monument to Scottish history. The old Pictish fort was discovered was situated on the sea stack just north of the castle and was carbon dated as about third century. A couple of hundred years later, the missionary St Ninian built a place of worship on the site where Donotter stands now, and a fortress was put in the place in the 12th century. The castle has been the site of many historical events, such as William Wallace capturing and destroying parts of the castle in 1297, royal visits from Mary Queen of Scots and James VI of Scotland in the 16th century, and Cromwell laying siege in 1651 prompting the Scottish jewels to be smuggled out. Even George Keith, who was the fifth Earl Marshal, brought a pet lion to the castle. You can find out more about the history of Donorter Castle on the official website, and there's an animated recreation of the original site by University of Aberdeen, which I thoroughly recommend you have a look at. This ink and crayon on paper was created by John Piper in 1984 and he has used strong colours and swirling brush strokes to dramatic effect, suggesting the movement of the wind and the sea. Looking at this artwork, it's easy to imagine the most mythical dramas that have unfolded on this historic site for centuries. 
Leaving the ruins of Donauter in our wake, we're now heading for a site bustling with industry, which is Aberdeen Harbour, where I will hand over to Rosie to tell you more about the people whose lives revolved around fishing for silver darlings. So here we are at the mouth of Aberdeen Harbour, watching the herring fleet put to sea. It's easy to think of herring fishing as a long established Aberdeen industry, but this painting of the herring fleet by David Farquharson uh, was painted in 1888 at a time when it was still fairly new to Aberdeen. At the end of the 19th century, the fishing industry was rapidly expanding and tens of thousands of barrels of herring preserved in brine find their way to Northern Europe and Russia. In this painting, we can see sailing boats, which judging by the light coming from the West, look to me as if they're heading out to sea in the late afternoon or early evening. We can see well-known Aberdeen landmarks like the Round House on the right on the pier, and we'll be looking at that again later. And on the left in the background, the brand new Victoria Bridge, which had just been built in 1887 to create a link to Torrey following a bad ferry disaster. After World War I, the sailing boats were increasingly replaced by steam powered boats, but the herring industry went into decline in the 60s and 70s. While the crews on the herring boats were all men, the work of gutting and packing the herring once they were landed was, as we can see from these photos, very much women's work. They are from two different periods, possibly late 19th century and maybe the 1940s, judging from the difference in the styles of clothing. Just imagine what it must have been like gutting and packing the fish in salt in all weathers with your bare hands with the salt getting into the cracks in your fingers. There were no rubber gloves till just before World War II. The herring lasses, as they were known, whether they were in their teens or their 70s, traveled all down the east of the British Isles, following the herring fleets from Shetland at the start of the herring season in May, as far south as Great Yarmouth and Lowestoft in East Anglia by the end of the season in December. And it was the arrival of the railways that made the herring lasses journeys possible. In the early 1980s, I met a lady from Fraserburgh who was by then in her 90s and she had been a herring lass and she told me how she'd traveled regularly up and down the East Coast and she'd actually met her future husband when she got to Yarmouth. So there must have been a few romances over the years. So I'm now going to hand over to Alan, who will tell you about some of the more unusual items in our maritime collection. Among the collections on display at Aberdeen Maritime Museum are the contents of a medicine chest, which was recovered from an Aberdeen trawler shipwrecked off Hoy in Orkney in the early 20th century. The many items include several glass bottles of liquids described as mixtures for the treatment of conditions like coughs, colic, fever, stomach problems and rheumatism. There was even a soothing mixture described as good for sleeplessness, irritability and overexcitement. The bottle we have chosen to show you on this slide on the left hand side is a diarrhea mixture which as you can imagine would be quite a problem to a sufferer on the high seas. The bottle is quite small, standing five and a half inches tall, about the size of a large bottle of cough mixture today. The prescribed dose is one tablespoon every four hours, and the mixture is described as good for diarrhea and derangements of the bowels. A label stuck on the bottom states that the dispensing chemist was Douglas Dickey of 96 Victoria Road in Torrey, successor to JG Much, telephone number 459. On the right hand side of the slide, we see a model ship which is displayed in the picture gallery of the Provost Ross Houses part of the Maritime Museum. It is a votive model which is a ship model placed in a church, usually hung in the nave as a fulfillment of a vow and a symbol of thanks to the heavens for 
safe passage at sea. The practice of donating ship models to churches was quite common across Europe, dating back to the 1400s. This model is known as the ship, spelt S-C-H-I-P, in accordance with its Dutch origins. It depicts a Dutch warship from the late 1600s and came to be associated with Aberdeen when it was donated to the Aberdeen Shipmaster Society in 1689 by one of its members, Alexander Mackey. In 1670, the society petitioned the council to have elevated seating installed at the Kirk of St. Nicholas. This became known as the Seaman's Loft and the ship was hung above it. Status was very important in the church congregations of those days, different trades jostling for the best seating position. It's been suggested that the seaman's loft and the then placing of the ship was as important to the symbolic status of the society as a votive offering to God. The ship came to the Maritime Museum in 1984 when the museum opened, originally on loan from the society where it had been hung at their headquarters in Regent Key. It was then restored by a local model maker to as much as possible recreate its original appearance. I'll now hand you over to Ruth to tell you more about another major industry that was at the heart of Aberdeen Harbour. One of Aberdeen's major industries, shipbuilding, had a worldwide reputation by the 19th century after the Hall brothers of Alexander Hall and Company designed the Aberdeen Bow. The raked stem was designed to resemble a fast swimming fish and was used on the clipper ship, the Scottish Maid. 3,000 ships were built during the 1800s and 1900s, mainly by the five big companies in the city, Alexander Hall & Co, Walter Hood & Co, The Duthies, John Lewis & Sons Limited, and Hall Russell & Company Limited. Amongst the other notable ships were the Joe Show Maru, designed for the Japanese Navy, the St Suniva, and the Thermopylae, an Aberdeen designed and built clipper ship that twice beat the famous Cutty Sark. Hall Russell Company was a partnership between Alexander Hall's two sons and the engineers Thomas Russell and John Cooper. It was the last of the Aberdeen shipbuilders closing in 1992, a few years after building its last ship, the St Helena. The Hall Russell male voice choir were so popular they won numerous national competitions and went on to release their own record. The choir won many awards and competitions during their heyday of the 1920s and 1930s. They won the Pollock Shields Philharmonic Challenge Trophy in the 1923 Glasgow Music Festival and won gold, gold medals at Aberdeen's music festivals in the 1920s. They were broadcast on BBC Radio and often gave concerts throughout Aberdeen and across the North East. We're about to listen to the Hall Russell Male Voice Choir sing the Weary Pano Tau and the Comrade's Song of Hope in this original recording by Beltona, 1932. These Beltona recordings were made in the ballroom of the Music Hall on Union Street. The conductor was Mr George A Innes, who was born in Aberdeen in 1881. We'll listen to a short excerpt, but you can hear the whole recording on the AAGM YouTube channel. Just 
along from Aberdeen Harbour proper is the old fishing town of Fitty, Foot D, and Rosie will tell you about an artist who was inspired by this little village. As the herring boat that we saw earlier left Aberdeen Harbour, some of the last houses they would have seen would have been the old fishing community, confusingly for non aberdonians like me, spelt Foot D, but of course pronounced Fitty. It's named not after its position at the mouth of the Dee, but after St Fittick, who came to Nig in the 7th century and is also the patron saint of gardeners. We're going to be looking at a painting that you can find in Gallery 7 at Aberdeen Art Gallery. This is called In the Gulf They Dream of Sea and Ice, and it was painted in 1991 at the time of the Gulf War by Joyce W. Cairns. This year is the 30th anniversary of the final stages of the war, so it's very appropriate to be looking at this painting just now. It hints at the hot, dusty and dangerous environment experienced by an Aberdonian soldier out in the Gulf as he thinks of home and the people and places, in this case Fitty, which he has left behind. Fitty was very familiar to Joyce W. Cairns, as she lived there for nearly 30 years when she lectured at Gray School of Art. So we can see once again the round house on the left at the back. This was the old pilot house and it's unchanged from 1888. We can also see the distinctive houses and the wooden sheds that are still to be seen today. This is our last view of Aberdeen as we travel on up the coast. Some artists take their inspiration directly out of the sea. Contemporary artist Rowena Park, based in the, the coastal town of Brighton, makes acrylic jewellery, such as these brightly coloured brooches. These highly decorated pieces, including longfish and angelfish brooches, can be found in the city's jewellery collection. Made in the 1990s, these pieces are designed to be worn pinned onto a dress or jacket. The decoration is achieved by engraving, inlaying and painting with hard finish enamel paints. The artist aims to make wearable pieces of art and she continues to make vividly coloured jewellery of all kinds. Another type of craft from this area of Aberdeen is Seton Pottery and here's Alan to tell you about it. The Seton Pottery was established in 1868 by Thomas Gavin and James Ritchie, located just north of where Mrs. Murray's cat and dog home is today. The pottery did not feature a maker's mark, but a piece of pottery inscribed Mrs. Gavin 1888 has been recognized as a typical example of their work, which has enabled further pieces to be identified as being manufactured at Seton due to the dab wear and agate pottery techniques used. Three colours were used, green, blue and brown, dabbed onto the surface with a moist cloth, then covered with a clear glaze. The main distinctive features of Seton pottery is that the text was produced with heavy triangular serifs. The top loops of the number eight do not join and the number five appears with the lower arc shape disjointed from the rest of the figure. We have on this slide two Seton pottery items from our collection, which are safely stored at Aberdeen Treasure Hub. There is a tobacco jar from 1890 made for a gentleman called George Kyloch in a brown and cream design. You can perhaps see from the top corner of the number eight that it is not quite closed off. Mrs. Murdoch Cheese Bell from 1895 incorporates the three pottery colours, green, blue and brown. And again, you can see this time in the number five, there is a disjoint in the figure. The second owners of the Seton pottery were local florists, Ben Reed and Company, who took over in 1904. They updated much of the machinery and focused more on art pottery including flower pots, malt dishes, butter dishes, bread pans, jelly jars, hanging pots and vases. They also manufactured domestic ware like teapots, jugs, food barrels and vessels for home decoration. 
In 1905, the range even extended further to include fern pots on pedestals, umbrella stands, and a variety of fancy and grotesque pieces, including crocus pots in the shape of elephants and chimney cans. Towards the end of the 1920s, more stringent health and safety regulations on lead-based glazing were introduced, and the output of pottery changed to being purely horticultural, centering around flower pots and bowls. Production increased and the future looked promising. However, in the 50s and 60s, the introduction of plastic pots and mass production methods led to Seton Pottery's demise, with the ground being sold to the Council for Demolition in 1966. We're now leaving Aberdeen behind us as we glide further north up to Cruden Bay. And we have on this slide two items from the collections. One is a George Washington Wilson photograph of the Cruden Bay Hotel from around its time of opening in 1899. And also a Great North of Scotland railway poster advertising the attractions of Cruden Bay, including an unrivaled 18 hole golf course, romantic rock scenery and the hotel itself. The inspiration for Cruden Bay Hotel came from the magnificent Palace Hotel in Aberdeen, which was acquired by the Great North of Scotland Railway in 1891, modernised and went on to be a great financial success. The company decided to expand their chain by establishing another grand hotel at Cruden Bay, built of local red sandstone and overlooking the seafront from a great height. The hotel opened on 1st March 1899 after extensive advertising in local and national press. Potential customers were told in newspaper adverts that a new seaside and golfing resort had been developed 30 miles by rail from Aberdeen, with a fine sandy beach over two miles long, a healthy climate and bracing air. Moderate terms were available at the hotel, which was electrically lit and had a lift. Recreations included bowls, tennis, croquet, sea bathing, boating and fishing with splendid rock scenery. The hotel's telegram address was health, an indicator of the message being sent to the public. Soon afterwards, an electric tramway was opened, the most northerly service of its kind in the United Kingdom. Passengers and their luggage were transferred from Cruden Bay Station to the hotel by two tram cars constructed at Kitty Brewster in the hotel's purple and cream livery. The Aberdeen Journal was very positive about the Northeast New Resort, reporting on the opening ceremony that the hotel, picturesque in sight and surroundings, beautiful in design and substantial in construction, had been equipped in a manner which is not being surpassed if indeed it is equaled by any similar establishment in the country. However, circumstances and public taste changed over time, and unlike similar developments like the Glen Eagles Hotel and Turnbay Hotel, the Cruden Bay Hotel was not a long-term success. Passenger services on the bottom to Cruden Bay branch line closed in 1932, and the tramway to the hotel continued only for the transport of supplies and laundry. Guests were offered, offered a motor car service direct from Aberdeen Station. During the war, Cruden Bay Hotel was requisitioned as a field training centre for the Gordon Highlanders in 1940 and did not reopen after the war. It was sold for demolition in 1947. The best parts of both tram cars were used to create a single car for preservation at Grampian Transport Museum. For those who are familiar with Cruden Bay, much of the hotel site is now covered by a housing development at Lynx View. Next, we travel up the coast to the Peterhead area to look at its famous granite industry, and I'll hand over to Karen. 
The coastal fringe between Bodham and Cruden Bay had over 20 quarries, with Stirling Hill being the most extensively worked. The first quarry on that site was opened in 1815, and at one time there were 11 separate quarries on the hill. Peterhead granite features in some notable places, such as the original Trafalgar Square fountains, the pedestal of the Duke of Wellington statue at Buckingham Palace, and the pillars of several London bridges. Many other examples can be seen around the northeast coast, of course. Perhaps the most well known be the McGregor Obelisk in Aberdeen's Duthie Park. Here we see a slightly smaller decorative item in our collection, which is a Peterhead granite clock case and clock associated with Bower and Florence Limited of the Spittle Granite Works in Aberdeen. It's about 16 inches long and 12 inches high. Not as big as an obelisk, but a pretty substantial size and weight, I'm sure you will agree. In the mid 19th century, the northeast coast was notorious for shipwrecks and the Admiralty was concerned that the lack of shelter for naval ships along the coast. A Royal Commission decided that a harbour of refuge would be built at Peterhead and convict labour was to be provided from a new prison just south of Peterhead. The prison was completed in 1888 and the first batch of 20 convicts arrived and put to work. Materials were quarried at Stirling Hill, so a railway line was constructed to carry the convicts between the prison and the quarry, as well as carrying the granite from the quarry to the breakwater via the prison yard. Well over a million tonnes of granite would have been quarried during the lifetime of the project, which was not completed until 1956. Warders were armed with cutlasses in the early days, and later on they were replaced by rifles as one prisoner was shot dead in 1932 when attempting to escape from the quarry. The last site on our journey up the coast today is a beacon of light for those at sea. It is the impressive Rattray Head Lighthouse, and here's Alan to tell you about it. In 1889, an application was drawn up by the fishermen of Peterhead to build a lighthouse at Rattray Head with engineer Alan Stevenson commenting that the area was notorious among mariners for its foul grounds, rapid tides and high and dangerous seas. No part of the east of Scotland was more dangerous than this. Also, a light was more important in view of the fact that a harbour of refuge was being built at Peterhead, as Karen just uh, alluded to. Sanction to go ahead was given in 1891 and work was begun the following year. The innovative design was for a rock tower built in two parts, as we can see on the left hand side of the slide. The lower part contained a foghorn, an engine room, the upper part the lighthouse keeper's room and lantern. The lower section was built with 20,000 cubic feet of granite, mostly quarried from Rube's Law being 46 feet high with an entrance door reached by a 32 foot high ladder. At high water, the tide rises to seven feet, but it was possible to walk ashore at low tide. The whole structure is 120 feet, tie, feet high, completed by 16 months work spread over three years. The five wick paraffin lamp first lit in 1895 had a candle power of 40,000, much stronger than the 6,500 at neighbouring Buckingham During the Second World War, three bombs were dropped and the lantern was machine gunned, but the efficiency of the apparatus was not seriously impaired and nor was anyone injured. A mains electricity supply and telephone cable were laid under the seabed, completed in 1977. And in February 1982, the lighthouse was made fully automatic and lighthouse keepers were withdrawn. I'll now hand back to Karen to conclude the session. So thank you for joining us on the virtual journey up the coast this afternoon, exploring the Aberdeen Archives Gallery Museum's collections along the way. It's nearly time for a fish supper and a cup of tea, but don't forget there are more ways to explore our collections on the AAGM website.
Thank you very much.